when we look back at the 2017 Survivor Series weekend, you're going to think back and say to yourself, damn, this was a pretty good weekend. With NXT TakeOver War Games being so fantastic on Saturday night, with Survivor Series itself actually feeling like a major pay-per-view once again, this was a very, very good weekend for fans of WWE Wrestling. When you look back at the 2017 Survivor Series weekend, you're going to ask yourself, is AJ Styles really that damn good? You better fucking believe it. When you look back at the 2017 Survivor Series weekend, you're going to ask yourself, why is Triple H so giving when he's in NXT? Why is he so giving with his young talent down at the PC and down at Full Sail University? But when it comes to Triple H on the main roster, it's like Triple H is a greedy fat slob at the Sizzler Buffet, snatching up every last fucking chicken wing. When you look back on the 2017 Survivor Series weekend, you're going to ask yourself, is Triple H really that stupid? Is he that stupid to believe that Braun Strowman would turn his back on Kurt Angle after Braun Strowman has been so loyal to Monday Night Raw and what Kurt Angle set out to do, all because he's Triple H, the COO. When we look back at the 2017 Survivor Series weekend and the Survivor Series event itself, you're going to realize that what you watched last night was just a Monday Night Raw versus SmackDown Live Super Show. There was nothing on the line. These men and women last night fought for nothing but bragging rights. And when you think back to the 2017 Survivor Series weekend, you're going to ask yourself, do I even care anymore? Do I care if this happens again next year? Why am I going to care? Why are these people fighting one another? If there's nothing on the line, what are they fighting for? That was the question I asked myself the entirety of this pay-per-view. I'm not going to sit here and tell you it was a bad show. I would be lying to myself. Did I enjoy myself through the majority of that show? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. But a show like this, would mean so much more to everybody if there was something that we could sink our teeth into. This mean, th- this show would mean so much more to everybody if you knew that what these people were fighting for was a setup for something else bigger down the line. If this is the current direction WWE wants to go, Survivor Series needs to be treated like a major deal. If this is the direction that WWE wants to go with this Raw vs. SmackDown nonsense, then changes need to be made where it needs to be more important. Survivor Series needs to feel more important. I don't want to watch just great wrestling. Behind every great wrestling match, there's a storyline. There's something there. There's something there to sink your teeth into, and there's a reason for you to care. If you're going to put Charlotte and Alexa Bliss in the same ring and have it mean nothing after someone's hand is raised, it's not something I really am interested in seeing. If you're going to have a 48-year-old Triple H have his hand raised in 2017 at a major pay-per-view for WWE, there better be a fucking reason behind it. Not because it's Triple H. If you're going to put the Shield in the New Day in a great opening match for Survivor Series, 
It better mean something. I felt after every one of these matches, except for one, I felt after every one of these matches, what did I watch? Why did I watch? For what did these men and women fight for? That's your Survivor Series 2017. That's the one thing I took away from this Survivor Series. WWE made the appropriate changes, the necessary changes for this show. They drastically changed the whole card. And at the end of the night, looking at this stacked Survivor Series card, which looked like it was the best card that WWE presented us all year for pay-per-view. I looked at this, and at the end of the night, I still, still felt underwhelmed. That can't be anymore, man. That cannot be anymore. Changes need to be made if Survivor Series is going to be a big four pay-per-view. We have the Royal Rumble. The Royal Rumble gets us to WrestleMania. WrestleMania leads us into SummerSlam. There should be a bridge in between WrestleMania and SummerSlam that gets us to New York City. That gets us to the Barclays Center every year. SummerSlam should get us to Survivor Series. Everything that happens coming out of SummerSlam should build towards Survivor Series. If you don't want to do the whole Raw vs. SmackDown thing all year, at least have it start coming out of SummerSlam. Start teasing it here and there. Survivor Series leads to nothing. Survivor Series leads to nothing. It's just a Raw vs. SmackDown super show for bragging rights. When we all know the bragging rights mean nothing. The bragging rights will mean something Sunday night in this fictional world that Stephanie McMahon is in. I gotta crush Shane McMahon. They'll mean something on Monday Night Raw. Then the next week, as we start getting into December, it'll mean nothing anymore. It won't mean a damn thing to anybody. WWE will go about business just like they usually do on a Monday and Tuesday night. And Survivor Series and everything that happened and the competition, the bragging rights, it's like it would have never happened. But if you want to make Survivor Series an important pay-per-view, if you want it to mean something at the end of the fucking year, you got to have it be a bridge between... Those months where nothing is going to happen. Survivor Series should lead us into the Royal Rumble. Something should happen. Whether the winning team gets home field advantage at WrestleMania. Whether the winning team has odds on favorites stacked with them. Going into the Royal Rumble. You know? Something. Something that these guys can fight for. Other than that, why are they even there? Why are they even there? Why am I even watching? It means nothing at the end of the night. But all in all, Survivor Series 2017 was a very enjoyable Survivor Series pay-per-view. Was it the best pay-per-view that WWE put on all year? I I don't even know anymore, man. WWE pay-per-view this year has been underwhelming at best. I can't even think back to what was the best pay-per-view of the year. If I had to choose one, I'd probably say the Elimination Chamber. But WWE gave us a stacked card. They gave us a decent show at the end of the night. In no way was it a bad show. But this was an underwhelming show, to say the least. This was an underwhelming show that at the end of the night had no passion It felt soulless and it felt empty. After everything that WWE did, all the strides that they made to make this show stand out as important, at the end of this four hours, we felt empty. I don't know how you guys felt. I felt empty. I felt like I watched a really good wrestling show for four hours. 
And I felt no emotional attachment to anything there outside of one match. This is your Survivor Series 2017 review. I am, of course, the Kenny Omega of WWE reviews, news, and talk right here on YouTube.com. I am JD from New York. Thank you guys so much for watching me this morning. Life happens. Review wasn't up. I tried to get it up as early as I could, and here I am. Either way, you're going to wait because it's always quality on this side of the fence. 2017 official Survivor Series review and results for last night's show, November 19, 2017, from Houston, Texas. We're going to go over everything that is Survivor Series. I'm going to give you my little thoughts and opinions on other things that I did not like about the show, what I did like about the show, and we're going to talk about certain things that happened that I really don't understand as usual, with the world of WWE. So, thank you guys so much for all that, man. If you if you would, please do so. Please hit that thumbs up. I would greatly appreciate it, man. Strap your belts in, grab your beverages, whatever time of day it is, whatever part of the world that you are in, listening or watching me. Just grab your beverages and hit that thumbs up, man. We're going to be in for at least 50 minutes of Survivor Series talk right here. On the channel. Follow me on Twitter at JD from NY206. Hit that subscribe button down below and turn on that bell for all notifications. If you guys missed any of my content this weekend, we got off the script. We got NXT TakeOver review live on the channel right now. If you guys want to know my thoughts on the amazing TakeOver that was War Games, make sure you guys go and check that out. Links will be within this video in the top right corner in the annotation that you see there. Make sure you guys go and support those videos as well. And I have more stuff coming throughout the day, so make sure you guys keep an eye and an ear on the channel. The show tonight is being brought to you guys by my fine friends over at audibletrial.com slash off the script. Audible today for Survivor Series is giving you guys 30 days free. That is one month free of their service, and that includes one free audio book. If you are a new listener, of this show, of this channel, and you guys want something for free, I'm going to give you guys one free audio book courtesy of Audible and 30 days free to try their service out. All you got to do is go to audibletrial.com slash off the script. Make sure you guys do that and you guys are on your way to venturing in the world of Audible. If you guys want that free book, it's free upon sign up. Over 180,000 choices to choose from. A lot of those are wrestling related, so if you guys want the new Justin Roberts book, if you guys want the new AJ Lee book, if you guys want the new Jim Ross book, The Death of WCW, Bob Holly, Daniel Bryan, Shawn Michaels, Brock Lesnar, Bret Hart, Dusty Rhodes, Ric Flair, they're all there. So you guys can get anything you want. You guys can even pre-order Mick Foley's new upcoming book this holiday season. That's audibletrial.com slash off the script. Do it. Do it now. It's a great way to support the show. First of all, I want to go over the goddamn fucking tacky t-shirts that each brand was wearing. Are you fucking kidding me? I mean, you want to make this show important. You want to make this show serious, right? What is with the goddamn fucking tacky Raw and SmackDown t-shirts? This was the first thing I put in my notes for last night's show. They were awful. They were actually awful. Every time someone ripped off their shirt, I actually popped. Because, God, they looked terrible. They looked awful. You should know, or if you watch the product, even if you don't watch the product, you should know. Even if you don't watch the product, who the fuck cares? If you watch the shows, you know who should be on each team. You know who is representing which brand. There's no reason to just put them in childish t-shirts as you're fucking sitting, as if you're sitting them down at the kiddies table, separating them from the adults, you know, at some big fucking event. Give me a break, man. That is absolutely tacky garbage. Guarantee you that's a Vince McMahon idea. Oh, we gotta have them uh, represented in Raw vs. SmackDown t-shirts. Give me a fucking break. Are you serious? You're going to have the Shield come out and wear half Shield, half Raw shirts. Well, Roman's not wearing anything. Why, is he special? 
What's so special about Roman that he doesn't get one of these brilliant-looking, fucking fantastic-looking T-shirts? Come on, man. Absolutely ridiculous. I gotta watch this main event to see Braun Strowman wearing a fucking uh, tank top that says Raw on it. Are you kidding me? Absolutely ridiculous, man. It makes the entire presentation look low budget. Looks low budget. Someone please tell me, this is the second thing I couldn't wait to talk about, someone please tell me why we needed a five-man fucking commentary team. Who thought this was going to be a brilliant idea? I I don't know why this was necessary. Did anybody really enjoy the bickering between five men that got downright cringeworthy at some points? I mean, I don't understand this. You got... You got few, uh, two men uh, uh, pledging their allegiance to their brand. You got two other men pledging allegiance to their brand. And then you got Corey Graves, who's indifferent to everything. Corey Graves, the only consummate professional there, who's just there to fucking call the wrestling action. And then make sense of what Booker T is trying to say. My God, if there, anyone, if there needs to be anyone abolished from the commentary team, it's goddamn Booker T, man. This is ridiculous. I don't know whether the guy's serious or, or if the guy's fucking... High on crack or something. I don't know what the fuck he's... Is he drunk? What is this guy talking about? Keeps calling AJ Styles kid. Called Nakamura ugly at one point. I don't understand this guy. Five men making cheesy jokes. Ultimately taking away from the action in the ring. It's it's in my notes. It's enough. Every week we get a three-man fucking commentary team. Should have been one set of three men. If you wanted Michael Cole... If you wanted Tom Phillips, and if you wanted Corey Graves, that would have that would have been fine with me. Take the three main guys, rotate them throughout the night. Have Phillips do some, have Cole do some, have Saxon do some, have Booker T do some, but all five at the same time. Awful, awful, awful fucking decision, man. Booker T has become insufferable the last four months. I can't listen to him anymore. I can't listen to him anymore. He's becoming, he's becoming Percy Watson on the main roster. Can't listen to him. He adds absolutely no value to anything on that show. Awful. Needs to go. Another thing with this show, this is actually a positive. I loved how WWE set the match order up for this show. I thought the right matches were placed in the right spots. And I think the overall show flowed very nicely leaving the last two matches obviously being the most important. It did, this is the takeaway from it though, it did become predictable at the end. When Raw was up 3-2 and we only had two more matches left to go, you kind of knew, and and WWE made it kind of predictable that, you know, with AJ and Brock coming up, that Brock wasn't going to allow Monday Night Raw to go uh, into that last main event pretty much with the big L. You know, because if Brock Lesnar didn't win that match, then SmackDown would have won the entire event. So you knew that wasn't going to happen. I love the match order. I love the way WWE positioned each match. But the fact that they did it the way that they did it, it made it overly predictable by the time the end of the show was coming. So there was a positive, yet there was a negative. I'm not saying the predictability is negative. Because there's nothing negative about that Lesnar-Styles match, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But... It did make it predictable. Predictable doesn't mean bad. It's just the way things lined up. But most of these matches were pretty damn predictable. Most of these matches were pretty damn predictable. But I did enjoy the way WWE set the match order up for the show. It flowed very nicely. This needs to be the last year, like I said in the intro. This needs to be the last year Survivor Series is about bragging rights. This leaves the, you know... The show ultimately meaning nothing in the end. You know, what are these guys fighting for? It it leaves the show emotionless. It leaves a show like this being just a random WWE super show on pay-per-view. The Royal Rumble gets you to WrestleMania. King of the Ring should get you to SummerSlam. SummerSlam should get you to Survivor Series. And Survivor Series should get you right back to the Royal Rumble in January. If WWE is going to continue to book Survivor Series this way every year, Survivor Series should get you to the Royal Rumble. It should be the bridge that gets you into the Rumble. Seriously. Whether that means the winning the winning brand gets rights or better rights or better odds in the Royal Rumble, whether they get home field advantage in WrestleMania, 
whether they get a few NXT draft picks, something that's going to make their brand stand out at the end of the night instead of, hey, we won and you guys lost. Nobody gives a shit about that, man. Have it play into the entire brand conflict that is Raw versus SmackDown. Give one brand an advantage. Give one brand something to fight for at the end of the night. Give one brand something to look forward to all year. If they're going into Survivor Series, they know this is going to be a major, major important day for their brand to make their brand better. Who gives a shit about bragging rights in some fictional world that WWE has created with conflict between Stephanie and Shane McMahon? Nobody cares. I want substance underneath that. We don't have that. My overall feelings on the show was going into the show, I was excited. There was no way, if you're a wrestling fan, looking at this card, that you were not going to be excited with a card this stacked. And I said this just the last couple of weeks. WWE made the necessary changes to get us to Survivor Series and give us a card. Whatever their reason was, I don't even give a shit at this point. Whether it was they felt NXT was going to outdo them, which they did anyway. Whether they felt NXT was going to outdo them. Whether they felt... They owed it to the fans to give us a great show after TLC was decimated by injury and sickness. Whether WWE had bad ticket sales for Survivor Series and they wanted to spice it up and entice it, you know, for people to come out on a Sunday night. I don't know. I don't know. There was no way you were going to not be excited about this show. But this is WWE we're talking about. They never do anything right and go through with it, and you feel really damn good at the fucking end. In typical WWE fashion, you always find some way to complain about something. They always find some way to ruin something. They always find some way to leave you feeling underwhelmed. And I'm not speaking out of my ass here, people. I'm just telling you exactly how I felt watching this show. Don't interpret that as me saying this was a bad show. I'm just telling you that with the way the card was, I felt nothing at the end of this show. I felt underwhelmed. And I guarantee you that some of you, most of you, are feeling that same way. They always find some way to continue to bury upcoming talent as well. It's another thing that I realized at the end of the night. No matter their age, no matter if you're a Nakamura who's 37, a Bobby Roode who's 40, no matter where you came from, these up-and-comers, right? Bobby Roode is an up-and-comer on the main roster because they just promoted him from NXT. Buried! Nakamura has been buried all year. Like a Balor, a Nakamura, a Rude, a Joe. All in light of pushing their top veterans that have seen their heyday already. Why is Triple H, I mentioned this, why is Triple H so good on NXT, but when it comes to the main roster, every time he's on television and in a major storyline, he has to end up being the most important part of the entire program. Did Triple H really need to close this show the way he did? Unreal, man. Unreal. And I'll talk about those little things when we get to the appropriate matches. But those are my feelings on Survivor Series 2017. The in-ring action was very good last night. Ultimately, it meant nothing. Ultimately, it meant nothing. Show started off in the perfect way possible. The Shield versus The New Day. This was a great way to start the show. WWE could not give us the Shield reunion on pay-per-view with TLC. So they figured, you know what? We're going to start this thing off with a bang. We're going to give you the Shield reunion to start the Survivor Series. Three on three against The New Day. All six men felt each other out. Ambrose went against Kofi. Rollins went against Woods. And obviously Reigns went against Big E. The Big E versus Reigns stuff was very fun, man. I could see if, if, and I know Big E mentioned a few times that come WrestleMania time, the shield is going to be no more because they're going to disband. Jealousy is going to eat them from the inside. They're going to turn on one another again. He, he mentioned several times that the, the, that the New Day would never do that to one another. And if there's coincidentally one man who I think would be breaking away from the New Day and going on his own, it's Big E. So it's funny that he mentioned that and that the Shield was going to be uh, splitting away from one another to come WrestleMania time because they all want to go on their own, their own path and do their own agenda. I find it funny that the one guy 
that uh, I see breaking away and having a big singles career from the New Day is Big E saying that stuff. So I could see Big E, if they do want to break Big E away from uh, the New Day, I could see Big E and Roman Reigns having some fun matches down the line, man. So the stuff that they did last night was very fun. Shield tried to throw some shade at the New Day doing the unicorn, the unicorn stampede in the corner on Xavier Woods. The New Day obviously seen that and returned the favor on Dean Ambrose just a few minutes later. Shit started to break down on, uh, on, uh, on everybody, and Big E almost fucking killed himself, as usual. One of these days, he's going to fucking cripple himself and paralyze himself. Almost killed himself and Dean Ambrose, where they spear off the apron through the ropes. Big E, you know, I think every single time he tries to outdo himself, I don't think he touched any rope on this suicide dive. He just flew right through the ropes, and he fucking cleared the top and middle rope doing that dive on Dean Ambrose. Like I said, one of these days, he's going to end his career. Ambrose was beat up for a good portion of the match, being isolated in the New Day's corner. Ambrose fought off two top rope suplexes here from Woods and Big E. Then he made the hot tag to Rollins, buckle bomb to Woods. Blind tag and flying clothesline by Reigns was a nice spot there. He eventually nailed the Superman punch to a chorus of boos. Now, the shield and the agenda of the shield is to get Roman over, correct? That's what we know of this S.H.I.E.L.D. reunion, but Roman was booed on this night. Roman was booed several times in this match. He nailed the Superman punch. He was booed. Roman sucks chance rang out through the arena, so uh, people still realize that, yeah, Roman may be in the S.H.I.E.L.D., but we still hate this guy. And it's only going to get worse as we get closer to WrestleMania, people. Don't let this facade fool you. This is just uh, Roman and Friends reunion. This is Roman and Tea Time with Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose. This ain't no fucking S.H.I.E.L.D. reunion. S.H.I.E.L.D. avoided the midnight hour. Rollins hits the V-trigger, and Ambrose hits Dirty Deeds for a near fall, broken up by Xavier Woods. Very nice, chaotic spot there in this match. Ambrose and Reigns take out Big E and Kofi by throwing them into the barricade, leaving three-on-one against Xavier Woods. Everybody thought it was over. They're all going to set up Woods for the Shield triple power bomb, but Big E awakens and pulls Roman's leg out from underneath the ring, and all chaos broke down here. Action all over the place. Kofi hit trouble in paradise. They took Roman out and left Ambrose in a three-on-one situation. So the tide turned from Woods being a three-on-one situation to now Ambrose being in a three-on-one situation. Woods had some freaky fucking strength here, man. By picking up Big E on his shoulders, Kofi flew over Xavier Woods as he was on Big E's shoulders for a big splash on Ambrose. Woods then propelled Big E down off his shoulders onto Ambrose with a big splash. Big E then picks up both Rollins and Ambrose on his shoulders for a double midnight hour. Reigns comes out of nowhere and spears Kofi to break it up. All six men now brawling on the outside. Kofi was left all by himself after Woods was taken up by Rollins and Ambrose gave dirty deeds to Big E on the outside. Kofi flew off the top and missed a big splash. Roman delivered a spear. Ending came when they delivered a super shield power bomb off the top rope. Massive spot there. Wins the match. Ambrose with the cover. The shield go on to defeat the New Day. In a first-time match between these two teams. This was an excellent way to open the show. This was an excellent match. I expected nothing else from the New Day who have... Honestly, this year with the New Day being together, this has been their best year together in rank. With the stuff they did with the Usos and what they did with the Shield at Survivor Series, this was a damn good fucking match, man, between two teams that have never met before. It really captured, and I put this in my notes, it really captured the true essence of Survivor Series, but ultimately, like I said, this is the first thing and right out of the gate. This was so great, but ultimately, what did this mean for any one of these guys? And what did this mean for Raw or SmackDown? It meant nothing but bragging rights, and it meant nothing in the end. I'd rather it be some storyline progression behind it that led to something for either Raw or SmackDown at the end of the night, besides the bragging rights aspect. Great match. Fantastic match. Lived up to what the Survivor Series really is. Minus the eliminations. But, what did it mean for either brand? What did it mean for either team? Nothing. It's like, hey, we won. Hey, you lost. That's all it is. Gotta do more with that next year, man. 
Raw versus SmackDown women. This was a match that uh, I have been fantasy booking for three weeks, even before Asuka was announced for the team. And this is exactly how it should have ended. This is exactly how I wanted it to end. And some people on social media tell me, oh, it was a predictable outcome and that it really wasn't difficult to figure out. So what are you talking about? I don't see you with the fucking podcast, motherfucker. I don't see you talking about WWE. I mentioned this before Asuka was even announced on Team Raw. Don't give me that shit. Predictable. This was exactly how it needed to be. This is exactly what they needed to do with Asuka. So, either somebody's watching my podcast, or I am just a fucking genius. One or the other. This match really didn't do anything for me either. They lost my attention in the first two minutes of this match. You want to know why? Because Becky Lynch, poor little Becky Lynch, keeps getting shit on all year. Becky Lynch needs a change of scenery. If they're not going to do anything with her with her on SmackDown Live, you got to get her off SmackDown Live. Simple as that. This is why I propose trades. This is why I propose trades. Get Sasha and Bayley over to SmackDown Live and give Raw Charlotte and Becky Lynch. Simple. Simple. That's not going to happen now because Charlotte's the women's champion. But Becky needs to come off SmackDown Live. They eliminated Becky in two fucking minutes. Becky did not see anything in this match but two fucking minutes of action with Alicia Fox and Bayley. That's an awful way to go out. An absolutely awful make to go out. Bailey makes a blind tag, tags in from behind. It was Alexa and Bay. Uh, it was uh not Alexa. It was Alicia and Becky to start it off, and Bailey makes a blind tag. Disappointing and not a good use of Becky in this match at all. Bailey rolls up Becky from behind with a roll up one two three, and that was it. So SmackDown was was without a team captain at this point. Oscar briefly tagged in, and you can see. Immediately, I seen it. I don't know if you goons seen it. You can see the intensity that she delivers compared to everyone else in that division. She's just something on a whole nother level compared to everybody else in that division. Bailey actually showed some intensity in this match because Stephanie McMahon before this match gave a pep talk saying, Bailey, no more hugs. I wish that was the case for the last fucking six months. No more hugs. Bailey showed some intensity until. She was hit with a super kick by Carmella, and then Tamina hit a super fly sm- uh, splash. She was eliminated. Now it's down 4 4. Bailey's eliminated, and Becky is eliminated for their respective teams. WWE thought it would be a nice moment for Tamina and Nia Jax to square off. Nothing really special there. I didn't pop. The fans in Houston had nothing better to do but pop. They just pop because both women are large women. I didn't give a shit. I see Tamina, who's green as fuck. I see Nia, who is coming along nicely, but still green as fuck. Nothing really special there, people. Move on. Nia Jax was counted out, of course. They gotta go about eliminating Nia Jax, just like they did last year. Can't pin Nia Jax. If they can't pin Nia Jax, maybe they should really make Nia Jax feel a little bit more important. You know, they're so afraid to pin Nia Jax, but they'll have her and don't mind her losing by a DQ or a count out. Start doing something more with Nia Jax. If that's the way you want to go about booking Nia Jax. Nia Jax was counted out because Tamina super kicked her out of the ring after she put her hands on Lana. Lana, like a dumbass, wanted to jump on the ring apron. So she was met with a big Nia Jax punch to the face. Naomi did a crossbody on Nia Jax to the outside, making her miss the 10 count. So nice awareness there by Naomi to take out Nia behind the referee's back. She misses the 10 count. So now SmackDown is up. 4-3. Now it was Naomi and Alicia Fox, man. And I don't know what the fuck happened here, but this was absolutely cringeworthy. You want to look up the definition of cringe. You just look up this sequence between Alicia Fox and Naomi, man. Really, really, really fucking sloppy exchange, man. I don't know what happened here. Miscommunication on several holds. There was a roll-up that was botched. It looked like Alicia was supposed to kick out because Naomi went right into her submission. 
her reverse rings of Saturn submission or whatever the fuck she calls it, the glow, whatever she calls it. She went from the roll-up right into the submission, but Alicia didn't kick out of the roll-up. She let the referee count three. The announcers were confused. The fans were confused. I was confused. You were confused. What a terrible looking spot that was. So then right away, Sasha Banks comes in. Naomi don't know what the fuck's going on. She gets eliminated. Sasha puts the bank statement on her and Naomi taps out in just a couple of seconds. So I don't know what the hell was going on there, man. Either way, Alicia and Naomi were eliminated. So now it's Asuka and Sasha. That's all that's left for Team Raw. Carmella, Natty, and Tamina for SmackDown Live. And as we get closer to the ending of this match, I'm like, hmm, this sounds familiar, man. Where'd you hear this one? <coughs> Off the script. <coughs> so we got three on two here. SmackDown Live versus Raw. Carmella slapped Asuka in the face. Obviously, she wanted a death wish on this evening. Obviously, that was going to trigger Asuka. She took Carmella's head off with a knee and a three count. Carmella was gone, just like that. Natty and Sasha had a physical exchange. Some really stiff shots there by, uh, by Natty. Sasha returned the favor. Until Natty got the sharpshooter on Sasha, making her tap. The boss taps out to the, to the sharpshooter. Natty had a nice showing here, man. After losing the uh, Women's Championship on Tuesday, she had a nice showing here, being the sole member of her team to meet death at the end of this thing. Death meaning Asuka. Tamina at this point was Natty's savior. Um, while in the, in the uh, I, I think Sasha had her in the bank statement, and Tamina saved Natty from tapping out. Uh, Natty was screaming, save me, save me. I don't know what fucking took Tamina so long, but uh, Natty was saved by Tamina, and then she got the sharpshooter on Sasha, and Sasha was tapping out. So now it's Asuka left all alone 201 against Tamina and Natalia. Tamina tried her best to take out Asuka, attempting a superfly sp splash and missing. Asuka seen an opening. She got a cross arm breaker on Tamina, making her tap. Asuka fought off Natty right into the Asuka lock right away. Soul Survivor, Asuka. And she looked good. The fans cared. The fans chanted. And the fans were excited, man. This was exactly how you had to do it. There was no way WWE was going to pin Asuka. There was no way WWE was going to make Raw lose with Asuka on the team. There was no way that Asuka was going to look weak in this thing. It would have been bad booking all around. The only winners of this team going in and the only sole survivor of this team was going to be Asuka and the only winner of this match was going to be Team Raw. So that's that, man. Good on WWE for making the right decision. Good on WWE for giving Asuka that extra push. Now, let's see what the next layer is in this story that is Asuka. Because Stephanie did mention, you know, Becky is going to want to break your arm in this match. I want you to break Becky's face. This is Asuka. The reason why we took you to Monday Night Raw, brought you to Monday Night Raw, rather, is because you're undefeated for over 700 days. So WWE knows that Asuka is undefeated for over 700 fucking days. Use that. You don't have that come along, waltzing on into your locker room, you know, every day. This is something special. Book her with care, please. Raw wins. Asuka is the sole survivor. Baron Corbin versus The Miz. If there was one match I didn't give a shit about, it was this one. I'm surprised this one didn't happen on the, on the pre-show. Apparently, they added more matches to the pre-show. Elias beat Matt Hardy. Uh, we had Owens and Zayn beat Fandango. Who gives a shit? That's not Survivor Series to me. This should have been on the Survivor Series pre-show as well. But I will tell you this. I will tell you this. Um, I expected a complete shit show for this match. I expected no chemistry between these two guys, between Miz and Corbin. But it, end, it actually ended up being a decent match. And it ended up being a decent match that nobody's going to be talking about tomorrow morning. That's all it was. Decent match for, for, for both guys, but it ain't going to be anything that's going to be talked about at work tomorrow morning or at school tomorrow morning. Corbin wins with this one. Uh, you know, He wins here with the end of days, putting SmackDown finally on the board. Raw's winning 2-1. I love Baron Corbin's theme. You know, people were, were upset that he uh, asked for a new theme and they changed his theme. His theme and his entrance is a thing of beauty, man. If he can refine his in-ring skill, and I put this in my notes, if he can refine his in-ring skill, he could be the total package on SmackDown Live. Seriously. Baron Corbin is so promising for WWE if he just focuses on getting better in the ring because he is still a little green. 
if he can focus on getting better in the ring, Baron Corbin could be a total package. I just don't care for the Miz as Intercontinental Champion anymore, man. I couldn't find a reason to care about this match at all. You know, U.S. Champion versus IC Champion. This should be a major match, but it doesn't feel like a major match because WWE hasn't really done anything with the U.S. title. They haven't done anything with Corbin. It's like they gave Corbin the U.S. title out of pity because he lost money in the bank, and the Miz hasn't done anything as Intercontinental Champion. All this talk that he wants to bring prestige back to the title, he hasn't done anything with the title. He was just being squashed by Braun Strowman on Monday Night Raw. How, how, how am I going to take this guy seriously as Intercontinental Champion? I can't. Maurice was pregnant at ringside. She was there. She couldn't be with the Miz to Raj, but she was there in the crowd. She kissed the Miz before the match. Corbin played a really good heel in this match. At one point, he verbally attacked Maurice on the outside. He told her, this is how a real man thuzz, uh, does things. I LOL'd. That was funny. Uh, Miz was completely uh, all about cutting Corbin down, using Corbin's size. Obviously, was going to be an issue here. Uh, he knew Corbin was the bigger man, so he cut Corbin down in half. Tried to cut him down by isolating his legs and his knee. That was the storyline in this match, eventually setting him up for a figure for leg lock. The Miz Taraj really didn't factor in here. Dallas got a cheap shot in on Corbin, but Corbin pretty much contained them for the most part. The Miz needs to stop doing the yes kicks, man. They are absolutely fucking awful. There is absolutely no intensity behind their delivery. It's just awful. Awful stuff. The Miz in general, his offense looks weak as fuck. It looks weak overall, especially with a more physical Corbin in the ring. You know, you got a weak-looking offensive moveset by the Miz. Meanwhile, Baron Corbin's looking to fucking tear your head off. Like I said, I expected a complete shit show here. I mean, it was okay for what it was. I felt Baron Corbin needed the victory more so than The Miz. The Miz was embarrassed on Monday Night Raw, so I figured they'd just keep that gravy train rolling. End of days to The Miz, out of nowhere, one, two, three. Baron Corbin wins, puts SmackDown Live on the board for Survivor Series. The Usos versus The Bar. Two of the best tag teams in all of the WWE. The Usos have never been better. Their heel shtick is... Leagues better than anything that is going on right now with any tag team in WWE. When the Usos speak, I listen. When the Usos wrestle, I watch. That's how good they've become with this heel run. Sheamus and Cesaro are doing the best work of their careers, too. Don't take anything away from the bar. Both Sheamus and Cesaro have done the best work of their careers. Pairing them together has been a godsend for both men. This is a rematch of sorts from last year's Survivor Series as both teams... We're the last two teams involved in the Raw vs. SmackDown tag team elimination match. If you guys remember, uh, Shane McMahon put uh, all his teams against Mick Foley's teams last year. Uh, all the teams representing each brand were in just one big elimination match that ended up being the Usos versus The Bar. So this is a rematch of sorts from last year's Survivor Series. The only factor that I was upset with is that both teams are heel tag teams. Both heels are heel tag teams, but the body of work that is both the Bar and the Usos will definitely make up for that. And by the end of the match, you're probably not even going to give a shit who's heel or who's babyface. It doesn't even matter. Because what you're going to see in the ring is going to be that damn good, and you're not going to care about both teams being heel. Jimmy Uso was beaten up pretty badly by Sheamus and Cesaro, isolating him in their corner. Cesaro kicked Jay off the apron viciously as Jimmy went to go make a hot tag. He got to his corner and realized that his brother wasn't there. So, thanks to Cesaro, great tag team wrestling tonight on Survivor Series, man. They're just two fucking teams that know what they're doing in a tag team environment. Jimmy escaped by pulling out a whisper in the wind. He escaped the clutches of the, uh, of the bar by pulling out a, a, a Jeff Hardy whisper in the wind off the top rope. Finally tag, tagged in his brother Jay. Jay back body drops Cesaro during this match. Cesaro's feet hit the turnbuckle and that propelled him to hit the fucking ground. The mat, head first and neck first, man. I don't know what it is with Cesaro. He's always taking some fucking devastating shot in some match that he's in. I mean, the guy just had, uh, has a string of bad luck. First, it was his teeth. Yesterday, that looked to fuck up his head, man. He looked a little out of it after that one. I got to tell you that. That was a brutal looking spot. Jay climbs to the top turnbuckle, gets caught with an uppercut, then into a Cesaro swing and a sharpshooter. He gets to the bottom rope to break the sharpshooter. Jay Uso survives the bar's finishing move, which is a combination Celtic cross and springboard elbow by Cesaro. Jimmy breaks up that pinfall attempt. 
Cesaro then has Jay in a powerbomb position. This is where things really broke down. Cesaro has Jay in a powerbomb position as Sheamus is climbing the top rope. Now, Jay is trying to fight out by punching Cesaro, and he takes Sheamus off the top rope with a fallaway slam off the top rope, and Cesaro power bombs them both down to the ground. Because he had to, pretty much, with the force of Sheamus coming off the top rope. Great looking spot. Jay went for the cover and barely got a three count. Crowd was going crazy at this point, like I knew that they would. The heel versus heel tag team dynamic went right out the window. Usos went on a super kick party. They channeled their inner young bucks here. They kicked everything in sight. They executed a DIY finisher. Meet them in the middle with dueling super kicks on Sheamus. Jimmy went for a suicide dive on Cesaro on the outside to make sure that he was not a factor in them winning the match. On the way over the top, he made the tag to Jay. So in midair, he made the hot tag to Jay. Jay went up to the top rope, delivered a superfly splash on Sheamus. One, two, three. The Usos prove why they are the best tag team in WWE. Damn good match, man. Damn good match. Cesaro and Sheamus are fantastic. I have never been higher on both men. I don't even think I would want them to break up at this point. Everybody wants a singles run for Cesaro. He's damn good, and he's fucking deserving of one. I'll tell you that, but pairing them together, they they are magic together, man. So are the Usos. Two of the best tag teams in WWE. I was the first one to vocalize my displeasure with this match. I would have much rather the Shield versus the Usos, but knowing the body of work that Sheamus and Cesaro give you in the ring, there was no way that this match was going to be bad. And they certainly proved that this was easily one of the best matches on Survivor Series night. The Usos win, proving why they are the best tag team in all of WWE. Just not with this Raw vs. SmackDown dynamic. They are the best tag team. They might be the best tag team in the world right now. Jimmy and Jay Uso. Their body of work right now in 2017 has never been better. And I'm excited to see where they go going on into 2018. Alexa Bliss versus Charlotte. I really don't know what to think about this match. On paper, it looks like a really good match, but the actual match itself wasn't anything special at all, man. I was actually bored for the majority of this match. This match was 85% Alexa Bliss in control, which made sense by the time this thing was over because I don't think anybody thought Charlotte was going to end up losing this match after she had already won the Women's Championship on SmackDown Live and the press that Ric Flair is getting this week for returning to WWE and for the special that they did on him with ESPN. There was, no way that, there was no way that Charlotte was losing this match. Charlotte's ribs were the story of this match while Alexa worked on her rib cage for most of the match. This match was very one-sided, like I said, and it wasn't very entertaining at all. Normally, I enjoy a good story in the ring, but I just did not enjoy the story here. I did not. And that goes to because... There was nothing to fight for. You know, Alexa is making, you know, this match all about her. She's in control for the majority of this match, but what is she really fighting for? Like, really? What are you fighting for? If Charlotte wins, what does she get? Nothing. If Alexa loses, what's going to happen? You're going to go back to Monday Night Raw, and you're not going to see Charlotte in the locker room. Who gives a shit? You didn't lose your title. Who gives a shit? You know? I just didn't enjoy the story that these women were telling. I thought it could have been better. Charlotte finally fought out of the grasp of Alexa with a beautiful sit-out powerbomb. That created some separation that Charlotte needed. Charlotte immediately went for the figure eight and was blocked by Alexa with a straight right hand. Man, I don't know what it is about Alexa's right hand, but it's quickly becoming a vicious move in her repertoire, man. She throws a mean right hand. Charlotte hits natural selection for a near fall. Now, every match that Charlotte has, she has to have her token moonsault spot. Here she did, and she misses it. She misses it, and Bliss goes for the cover, but Charlotte kicks out. Bliss goes for DDT. Charlotte kicks out. Bliss yells at Charlotte, why won't you give up? I don't know why. Charlotte pulls out a spear from nowhere, eventually hits her big boot, and a figure eight for the win. Alexa Bliss taps out to the figure eight. I may note here, man, with the announcers keeping score up until this point, it made it all that much more obvious who was going to win the last two matches. This is why I mentioned in the beginning that WWE keeping score throughout the night and with Charlotte winning this match, putting up SmackDown 3-2 over Raw, 
you know, it was, it, it just made it all that much more predictable about, about who was going to win the next two matches and who was going to win the overall Raw vs. SmackDown night at Survivor Series. Not saying that predictable is bad, it's just that, you know, I wish WWE would downplay those types of things so that the common idiot doesn't realize that, you know? But I seen it, I heard it, and it's like, uh, you know, I know AJ's not going to win. I, I didn't expect SmackDown Live to beat Team Raw. But Charlotte wins here, putting up uh, three, what is it, 3-2 at this point for SmackDown Live. I didn't give a shit about this match, man. On paper, it looked great. On paper, it sounded fantastic. But the actual match that these women had, very boring. And it meant nothing in the end because these women were fighting for nothing, man. These women were fighting for nothing. Finally, we get to something that I can actually sink my teeth into. So, finally, something that would make me raise a fucking eyebrow every now and then. Finally, something that I was genuinely excited for. AJ Styles versus Brock Lesnar. Universal Champion versus WWE Champion. Brock Lesnar. You know, we can all shit on Brock Lesnar. We can all shit on him for being a laxed champion, a lazy champion, someone who just merely wants to collect a paycheck. I'll get to AJ Styles in a minute, man, but for the first time all year, I'm going to sit here and tell you that I am very proud of Brock Lesnar. I'm very proud of what he did for AJ Styles last night. You know, the little things count. It's the little things that matter most to me, man. Attention to detail. The closing sequence of this match seen AJ Styles get put in an F5. Now, it was a phenomenal forearm spot, springboard, off the top rope caught by Brock Lesnar into an F5. A lot of people were claiming that Brock Lesnar was injured. People were claiming that he was injured all over Twitter. I was on Twitter when the match happened. Oh my God, Brock Lesnar's knee buckled. He might be hurt. I knew Brock Lesnar wasn't hurt, and I knew he wasn't hurt because this is typical Lesnar. Brock Lesnar is a good storyteller, man. I don't think Brock Lesnar gets the credit that he deserves for being a really fucking good storyteller. He is damn good. And what he did for AJ Styles last night, and just that little instance, that little attention to the detail, where he caught AJ Styles off the top rope, and his knee buckled because his knee was an issue in this match. Not only did he miss a big knee strike in the corner, hitting his knee on the top turnbuckle, he was also put in a calf crusher. And Brock Lesnar sold the effects of that knee in the storyline, making the story in the match all that much more greater. For when that spot happened, his knee buckled. Brock l meant to make his knee buckle there. I don't think Brock Lesnar gets the credit that he, that he deserves. He turned it up tonight, man. He really turned it up tonight. Brock Lesnar earned his paycheck tonight at Survivor Series. I mentioned that the match that he had with CM Punk several years ago at SummerSlam should have been a blueprint for what AJ Styles and Brock Lesnar did at Survivor Series. I'm not going to say that this match was better than that one, because I really fucking enjoyed that match. But that was the blueprint that WWE should have followed for this match, being that, you know, AJ and CM Punk are, you know, in similar size, similar weight, going up against the same opponent in Brock Lesnar. Do we even have to question how good AJ Styles is anymore? I mean, nobody should ever question how good AJ Styles is ever. I don't want to hear that AJ Styles is a vanilla midget. I don't want to hear or see people happy that AJ got his ass kicked last night. It's not about AJ getting his ass kicked last night. It's about AJ surviving Survivor Series. It's about AJ surviving a match with Brock Lesnar. It's about the fucking story that was told in this match. You know, if you're going to downgrade AJ Styles because you don't like these indie indie marks and these indie indie darlings, right? Then I'm automatically going to disassociate myself with you, whether that means a benching on Twitter or a fucking ban on my YouTube comment section. There's no way anybody on this night can say anything bad about AJ Styles. Yeah, you people wanted Mahal. Some of you have the gall. And the fucking balls to tell me that you're unhappy with Jinder Mahal losing the title. That you'd much rather have seen Jinder Mahal versus Brock Lesnar last night. Are you fucking out of your mind? How do you watch that match last night and wonder what Jinder Mahal would have done against Brock Lesnar? How could you even want to see that? 
after what AJ Styles did last night. Now you know why WWE changed the match. There's no way that Jinder Mahal was going to do a tenth of what AJ Styles did in that match. Brock didn't want to work with Mahal. This is the kind of match Brock wanted. AJ lost. And I was concerned. I was concerned because AJ had just won the WWE Championship. Finally. Took it away from that fucking failure known as Mahal. I was worried. Even with Mahal as champion. If they were going to go through with that match. I was worried. That they were going to bury the WWE Champion. Because I didn't think anybody was going to get past Brock Lesnar. AJ Styles at the end of this night. At the end of this match. Has absolutely nothing to be ashamed of. In fact I think AJ looks stronger. After this match. I was worried that he was going to be buried. And that this was going to be a fucking 7 minute affair. They went 15 fucking minutes. The longest match that Brock Lesnar had all year. In fact, he went longer with AJ than he did with Joe and Strowman combined. So obviously he wanted to work with AJ. If he didn't, he just would have went in there, suplex, suplex, suplex. Let's get my paycheck and go back to the hotel room and fuck my wife. AJ looked even better coming out of this match than he did walking in as WWE Champion. That's a testament to how fucking good AJ is. That's a testament to how good Brock Lesnar was tonight. Both men delivered. There's absolutely nothing that AJ can't do. There's nothing that this man can do. AJ can work with anyone, clearly, after last night. No matter the shape, no matter the size. AJ can work with anyone and make it look fucking great. It's a reason why he is the best wrestler in the fucking world. The man brought Brock Lesnar to the best Brock Lesnar match possibly in his career. In his career. Especially in this modern run that we have with Brock Lesnar. I might be pulling straws with that one. The match with The Rock in 2002 SummerSlam, that was a pretty damn good Brock Lesnar match too. But I'm talking about current Brock Lesnar run. The only match that I can think of that Brock Lesnar had a better performance in was the triple threat match that he had with Seth Rollins and John Cena at the Royal Rumble. And his match with Roman was really good, man. I can't downplay how good that Roman Reigns match was. But this was no... A- but, but I mean, that was no AJ Styles. Roman is no AJ Styles. But if you're talking about Universal Championship reign, easily the best match of this reign. You want to go back and talk about his WWE Championship reign before that? It may be better than everything he did as WWE Champion as well. This was a damn good fucking match, man. Like I said, I was afraid Styles was going to look embarrassed in this match. He absolutely looked amazing in defeat, and he looked stronger in defeat here. AJ Styles should not be criticized, or the WWE Champion should not be criticized after the performance that AJ Styles put on last night. There's no way. There's no way anybody could say anything negative about AJ Styles or this match. Match of the night. No question. Was it match of the weekend? No. No. Match of the night? This blew everything on this show out of the fucking water. Lesnar absolutely manhandled AJ Styles through the early portion of this match, throwing him around like he should have been throwing him around, like a piece of garbage. Styles was a much smaller man. Brock Lesnar's a fucking beast. You're going to throw your opponent around because you are the much larger man. Lesnar dragged Styles by his hair at one point in this match from one corner to the other and flung him over his head in a belly-to-back suplex, landing him in the opposite corner that he originally dragged him from. I LOL'd. Not because I want to see AJ Styles get fucking his ass kicked, but just the, 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 the beating that Brock Lesnar was giving AJ Styles at this point. Styles sold Lesnar's suplexes like a fucking consummate professional, man. He made them look even better than they already do. Lesnar was incredibly physical and legit in how he handled AJ Styles. At one point, they were on the outside. Lesnar threw AJ Styles into the German announce desk, and I swear to God, you look at Brock Lesnar's face, he wanted to fucking throw him through the fucking table. I don't think Brock Lesnar would have been happy with what he did last night. He wanted to throw him through the table. He wanted to imprint AJ's body on that announce table. That's how hard he fucking threw him. Would have injured a normal man, but AJ ain't no normal man. Through the first four minutes of this match, you can honestly feel like this was going to be a complete squash. 
that this was heading for disaster. Lesnar set Styles up in the corner for a running knee. He connected. It's as if fucking uh, Styles' face went into the fifth row. That's how hard he hit him with a flying knee. Lesnar hit Styles with a flying fucking knee in the corner. AJ tried to fight Lesnar but blocked everything. Lesnar blocked everything that he had coming to him. So he, he, he bats AJ down to the ground and then he starts, he starts jumping around. He's like, he starts doing one of these things. And then he, says, he starts yelling, come on and fight me. I'm like, whoa. This was fucking physical, man. There's a reason why they're paying Brock Lesnar big money. If we got this Brock Lesnar throughout his entire run as Universal Champion, I would not complain half as, as half as what I did. But this was Lesnar. This is the Lesnar I wanted to see here. Lesnar went for an F5 and Styles escaped. He escaped the F5, ran to a corner. Lesnar chased him, went for another flying knee, missed. Styles hit him with a DDT. No covers yet in this match. No near falls yet. AJ tried for what looked to be a tornado DDT, but Lesnar seen it coming, I guess. It looked like it might have been a botched spot, but it, it looked like a tornado DDT because Styles jumped off the turnbuckle and spun him around in a DDT position, but Lesnar dropped AJ right on his face, just escaping that hold. AJ then got up and hit a Pele kick, went for a phenomenal forearm, and Lesnar caught him and turned him inside out with the suplex. People going crazy at this point, man. Will AJ ever get one of his big signature moves on Lesnar? That was the question. Lesnar tried for a clothesline. His clothesline was so vicious that his weight propelled him over the top rope. So I don't even know if he connected all the clothesline, but his weight shifted him over the top rope. AJ then sees an opening. He flies over the top with a springboard, forearm, uh, or slingshot springboard, elbow, slingshot, forearm, over the top, whatever. Then he jumped off the steel steps and hit another forearm, carrying his momentum off the steel steps. AJ throws Lesnar back in the ring, hits a springboard moonsault, picture perfect. And you talk about picture perfect, man. He hit the most perfect 450 springboard splash I've ever seen for a close three count. The first near fall of this match. Absolutely fucking beautiful 450. Styles then dared to go for a Styles Clash. Lesnar went for another F5 and Styles reversed that into a calf crusher. Lesnar was selling the shit out of this calf crusher. Crowd was going crazy. Lesnar. The only way Lesnar would know how to break out of a, st- of, of a calf crusher, take the man's head because you're the much larger man, and bang his head on the ring mat as if it was fucking Shaquille O'Neal dribbling a basketball at the foul line. Holy shit, man. Absolutely vicious, brutal spot there to escape the calf crusher. Lesnar goes for another F5, and Styles has the phenomenal forearm, and everybody thought he had won. He went for another F5. He escaped. Went for the phenomenal forearm. He hits it. Lesnar kicks out, near fall. Styles is like, I got this, I got this, I got this. He goes for another one. But like Gorilla Monsoon used to say, he went to the well once too often. The first forearm worked. Doesn't mean the second one was going to work. He gets caught in an F5. He gets face planted into the mat. And Brock Lesnar wins the match. This was... Every bit of a champion versus champion fight that you would have wanted. You talk about champion versus champion, everything else up until this point paled in comparison. You want a champion versus champion environment, these guys created it, these guys brought it. This was easily, far and away, the best thing on this show. This may may end up being one of the best matches of the year. AJ Styles and Brock Lesnar brought it. I was happy with what they did. And I'm fucking so happy. At the end of this thing, after after what we've seen here, I'm so happy that WWE decided to get Mahal out of this equation. Good shit on AJ Styles and Brock Lesnar. Lesnar wins with an F5. Match of the night. Main event. I got a lot of notes about this one. Raw versus SmackDown. After all, the long, drawn-out introductions. Raw was introduced first. SmackDown had shorter introductions, but they were introduced second. They all lined up in the aisleway. Raw was in the ring. Bell rings. We got Braun Strowman staring a hole right through Shane McMahon. You know Braun Strowman wants to go to work. 
First thing I want to mention here before I get into any type of uh, sequences or review for this match is something that Booker T said, and I quote, If you think Nakamura is ugly now, wait until Braun Strowman gets a hold of him. Where the fuck did that line come from? Where did he get that line? Was he fed that line from a Vince McMahon or a Kevin Dunn in the back? Like, why was that necessary, and wh- why did that add any commentary value to the match? Like, I don't understand why that was said. It was just completely out of place, and that was only one thing that Booker T did. That one just stuck out more than anything else that he said. This match was fun for the first 10 or 15 minutes or so. If you want to compare this to the match that we got last year, my God, man, last year's Survivor Series men's match between Raw and SmackDown blew this shit out of the fucking water, man. It's it's amazing how WWE lines up all this star power in one match, yet they can't be better than what they did last year. There's nobody watching this review right now, and nobody that watched this show last night that said to themselves that this match was better than last year's men's versus uh, Raw versus me, uh, SmackDown men's match. There's no way. There's no way. This match was 10 to 15 minutes or so of fun. The dream match scenarios were fun to just see happen before your eyes. They were plentiful in this match. I think WWE did a fun job introducing you to most of them. You had Balor and Nakamura, which was a fun encounter. Nakamura did that uh, good vibration shit that he does in the corner. Finn Balor reversed it and did it too sweet right on Nakamura's forehead. Crowd chanted NXT. Crowd chanted New Japan. While both guys were mixing it up in the ring, Randy Orton probably rolled his eyes somewhere on the corner. I would have loved to see Randy Orton's fucking uh, indie facial expressions there while they were chanting New Japan. I would love to see Vince McMahon's fucking uh, reaction when they were chanting New Japan with these guys in the ring. But Nakamura's ugly though, right, Booker T? Fuck out of here. Nakamura and Triple H was fun. Triple H and Bobby Roode was fun. They traded spine busters. Triple H told Roode to suck it. Roode did glorious to Triple H. Everybody was really into it. Like I said, fun. Balor and Orton was fun. Gave you a glimpse of what those two could possibly do in a, in a future feud. Joe versus Orton. Angle versus Rude. Angle versus Nakamura, where Nakamura got some of his signature strikes in on Angle. Good stuff, man. It was fun stuff for the first 10 to 15 minutes. Then Nakamura was the first one eliminated. Nakamura was the first one eliminated. If there's anybody that needed a good showing in this match, it was Nakamura. As if the guy hasn't been through enough already all year. Putting him in shit matches with Jinder Mahal. Putting him in meaningless feuds with Baron Corbin. The guy has done nothing all year. Then you're going to have him eliminated first? Are you fucking kidding me? I mean, I don't understand this. But then I got to thinking. Then I got to thinking. It could have been any one of these guys being eliminated first. And it would have been a fucking problem and a complaint from somebody on social media. So I don't know why Nakamura had to be the first one to go. I would have rathered somebody else to go. You, you could have surprised me. You could, you could have had John Cena be eliminated first. You could have Braun Strowman power slam John Cena. John Cena wasn't even supposed to be there. Nakamura should have been there at least through most of the match. But to have him eliminated by Braun Strowman first, I don't like that. I don't like that call at all, man. But why it had to be him, I don't know. Um... Moving on from here, man. He was actually on fire before he got eliminated. He was taking out all team in Raw. Strowman made the blind tag. Power slam Nakamura. He was gone. So Nakamura was eliminated by a Braun Strowman power slam. Soon after Bobby Roode came in, he, he thought his luck would be better against Braun Strowman. Negative. He had a nice blockbuster neckbreaker off the top rope on Braun Strowman. It did nothing. He no-sold it. He power slammed Roode and eliminated Roode and Nakamura in a span of one minute. So he eliminated two of NXT's darlings... In one minute. So NXT talent, once again, being shafted on the main roster. This is why I say, I don't understand why WWE, with NXT, with Triple H running NXT, why he cares about them so much, and then these guys get to the main roster and nobody gives a shit about them. Why they're treated like shit. Why Triple H is so giving in NXT, but when it comes to WWE, he's always got to be the one to look good. Even against his fucking, his students. You know? It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Team Raw started to argue then. So they were up 5-3. to three. They started to argue out of nowhere. Joe and Strowman started shoving each other. They started fighting. 
Triple H and Angle needed to calm things down. Orton and Cena tried to take out Strowman. So we had a team of Shane, Orton, and Cena in 2017. It's great stuff there, WWE. Really, really investing in the future there. Land of opportunity is SmackDown Live when you got Shane, Orton, and Cena on one team remaining. Yeah, sure. They tried to take out Strowman because that's they, they, they figured that that's the only way to win this match. We've got to take Strowman out. He already eliminated two of our guys. Let's take him out. Like I said, they tried. Strowman cleared off the German announce table. Cena and Orton tried to double suplex Strowman through the announce table. It wasn't working. So Bobby Roode and Shinsuke Nakamura, who was still around ringside, I guess, came over and made it a four-way suplex, and they put Strowman through the table, taking him out of the match. Shane McMahon then wanted to do an elbow drop through the remnants of the table on Strowman. Samoa Joe said, fuck you, I got other plans. He superplexed Shane McMahon off the top rope, back into the ring. So he was taken out of the match. Joe and Cena now mix it up one-on-one. Balor calls Joe to get eliminated because he tagged himself in. He tagged himself in. Cena was on the ground. He tags himself in to do the coup de gras. Joe said, what the fuck are you doing? So Joe goes to the apron, says, fuck this shit. As Finn Balor's up on the top rope, he blind tags himself back in. And all of a sudden, you see him eat two AAs from John Cena. So Finn Balor calls Joe to get eliminated. He eats two AAs from John Cena. Now it's 4-3, Raw, SmackDown here at this point. Raw 4, SmackDown 3. So Samoa Joe, another one, up from NXT, gone. So that makes Nakamura, Bobby Roode, and Samoa Joe, gone. Eliminated from this match. Cena versus Angle after Joe was eliminated. Now we got some uh, typical Cena bullshit here against Angle. He did the five-knuckle shuffle. Angle reversed it into the ankle lock. Cena reverses that. Tried for an AA. Angle reverses that into an angle slam. Balor comes off the top rope for a coup de gras. Angle hits another angle slam. And Cena is gone. So Cena is gone. Eliminated by Kurt Angle. Raw is up now. 4-2. Raw is up 4-2. They still got Strowman, H, Balor, and Angle at this point. All that's left is Orton and McMahon. Orton versus Balor now. Balor runs to the outside and missile drop kicks Shane McMahon. My fucking God. He missile drop kicks Shane McMahon so hard that I think one of his sons caught his eyeballs front row. That's how hard Finn Balor drop kicks Shane McMahon. Balor went for his finisher on Orton, and I thought, I thought Orton was going to pop up and catch Orton, uh, and catch Balor, rather, off the top rope in mid-flight doing a coup de grace. That's what I thought was going to happen. That would have been the right thing to do, to send the, the crowd home happy. But no, nope. Finn Balor misses the coup de grace, lands on his feet, gets caught with an RKO anyway. Balor out of nowhere, gets hit with an RKO, he's gone. Raw up 3-2, Balor is done. So Nakamura, Rude, Balor, and Joe, all gone. Yeah, some opportunity from NXT up to the main roster, huh? Good shit, WWE. Shane was looking for a tag from Randy Orton, and out of nowhere, Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens appear and attack Shane. Now, this was the worst fucking calculated attack I think that WWE could have planned here. Shane no-sold this entire attack, grabbed a steel chair, and fought both men off, chasing them up the ramp. And then he stood on the ramp with the steel chair so that they don't come back and interfere. Meanwhile, he left Orton in the ring all by himself. So Shane, thinking about Sammy and and Kevin Owens, leaving his partner in the ring to receive a running power slam from Braun Strowman. He just sacrificed Randy Orton to Braun Strowman. Now Raw is up 3-1. Shane is all by himself. This is where the match completely lost me and everybody as fans. Up until this point, it was okay. Still comes nowhere close to what they did last year for Survivor Series Raw vs. SmackDown men's match. This quickly turned into the Triple H. Let's hog the spotlight at the Survivor Series Raw vs. SmackDown men's match. And let me have my token Survivor Series moment, as if I don't have enough already. Strowman was about to end it, and Triple H tags himself in. Angle then tags himself in, because he wants Shane McMahon. He promised Stephen McMahon he's going to deliver Shane McMahon's head on a platter. So, Angle and Triple H start arguing. Angle and Shane go at it. 
Very nice exchange between the two. Angle eventually hit the angle slam and then put Shane in the ankle lock. Shane would not tap. Shane couldn't tap. He didn't want to be a failure for his, his brand. Triple H got so pissed that Shane wouldn't tap. He comes in and he pedigrees Angle in the ring. Nobody knew what the fuck was going on, man. Everybody at this point was confused. Is he aligning with Shane McMahon? Is he lining with family? Is he betraying his wife? Is he joining SmackDown? I don't know. Nobody knew what was going on. Everybody was so confused at this point. Triple H put Shane McMahon to top it all off. Shane McMahon on top of Angle. He eliminated Angle. He pedigreed Angle and then he put Shane McMahon on top of Angle to eliminate Angle. He wanted to eliminate Angle himself. Which clearly is going to set up Angle versus Triple H at WrestleMania. That was that was it. That was the seed right there. That seed is going to grow and it's going to be full blossomed in New Orleans. Strowman thought he was in a two-on-one situation at this point. Strowman thought that Triple H was actually aligning with Shane McMahon. He thought he was all by himself. He thought Triple H was now siding with SmackDown and that Braun Strowman was going to have to fight this match all on his own. Triple H then picks up Shane McMahon and pedigrees Shane McMahon to win the match. All because he wanted to end Shane himself. He felt like Angle couldn't do it. So he had to do it himself. Triple H sacrificed Angle to win Survivor Series for himself and Team Raw in 2017. Triple H could be so giving in NXT, but when it comes to the main roster, it's all about the man with, tr- with three H's. Strowman didn't trust Triple H. He choked out Triple H and said if he double-crosses him again, he will never play this game ever again. I don't understand why Triple H thought that Braun Strowman was going to be okay with this. Braun Strowman was loyal to Kurt Angle throughout this entire Survivor Series build and throughout this entire invasion. Braun Strowman was the first man that Kurt Angle picked for his Raw Survivor Series team. So there's got to be some loyalty and allegiance there. Why Triple H thought that Strowman was going to be okay with all of this? Braun Strowman, of all people, you thought was going to be okay with this? There's storyline logic there. Is Triple H really that fucking stupid? Is he really that stupid? How can this man be so brilliant in NXT, but then be so stupid on the main roster? It makes no sense to me, man. Triple H then tried to pedigree Strowman after being choked out, and he was met with two power slams to close Survivor Series. Braun Strowman was the sole survivor for Monday Night Raw as he power slams the COO. Could they be setting up Braun Strowman versus Triple H at WrestleMania? I don't know. Maybe they are. Maybe we get Braun Strowman versus Triple H and Jason Jordan versus Kurt Angle at WrestleMania. I don't know, man. A lot of different ways we can look at it. A lot of different ways we can think about it. But what I thought of Survivor Series 2017 is that what is that it was a good effort. It was a good show. Ultimately, left you underwhelmed with a shit ending, and a match that came nowhere close to what they did last year for Raw versus SmackDown Survivor Series men's. No way. Last year's match was so fucking great, so great. That match went almost an hour, and gave you everything. This match, I don't know what it was, man. All this fucking hype between these dream match scenarios. All the NXT guys got buried and eliminated before everybody else. No, there's no spotlight on the guys you brought up. The spotlight continues to be on the veterans. Spotlight continues to be on Triple H in 2017. Triple H should be a a, a backing player here while everybody else that's up and coming should be forefront. You know, the Ortons, the Cena's, the Triple H's, the Angles, the McMahon's, they should take a step back and make the Nakamura's, the Joe's, the Ballers, the Strowman's, Rude's stand out. It was the complete opposite. Meanwhile, you got a fucking shit ending that confused the shit out of anybody and doesn't make any sense. Survivor Series was very underwhelming, man. Not saying it was a bad show. It was a good show. Made Survivor Series feel special again. That angle... Triple H shit, I didn't care for, man. I, I really didn't understand what the fuck was going on down there. Styles and Lesnar stole the show. Shield vs. New Day, great. Bar vs. Usos, great. Everything else, didn't really care for it, man. They need something to fight for. You gotta give these guys and brands something to fight for in the end. Hopefully they make the appropriate changes next year to make it feel that much more special. Survivor Series next year is gonna be in Los Angeles. Hopefully WWE comes out of the gate swinging, starts this conflict between Raw and SmackDown a little bit early. I recommend after SummerSlam, 
Don't save it for the last three or four weeks of the build just because it's Survivor Series. Have it mean something. Set grounds for some rewards, draft picks, a Royal Rumble spot that's better than somebody else. Main event at WrestleMania. Something. Give these guys a reason to fight. Otherwise, you're not going to give us any reason to care. That is your Survivor Series review and results. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you guys so much. If you did, hit that thumbs up, and I'll be back today with some more content right here on the channel before Monday Night Raw. I am JD. Thank you guys so much. Much more to come today, and I'll see you guys tonight for Monday Night Raw, the fallout from 2017 Survivor Series.